Morning. Happy long weekend. What? You didn't even know this. You got an extra hour of sleep. The weekend's longer. I love that, like, you know, when I was a kid, it's like, you showed up on this Sunday, and it's like, <laughs> nobody got the memo, right? Like, half the people weren't there, especially the young people. They never knew when daylight savings. Now it's like, it just changes. We don't even realize until, at least I had this freak out moment this morning. Like, I woke up before my alarm, which I thought was weird, but then I just thought, maybe I'm just really disciplined. And then I, you know, went down to make my coffee, and I look at the clock on the stove, which is obviously analog and doesn't change automatically, and I had a little panic attack like I was late. So anyways, um, for all you who know that anxiety, happy long weekend. It's so good to be with you. Uh, my name's Mark, in case we haven't met, and uh, we are continuing on our series called Unexpected Jesus. And we've been going, usually we do a series for like four, six weeks. We've been going for months, and we'll continue to, uh, looking at the life of Jesus through the lens of one person. His name was Luke. Uh, we learned he was a doctor, and he was incredibly detailed. In fact, it probably took him years to put this story together to put kind of, you know, visit to different places, ask questions, find out details. Were you there? Okay. And you said you got healed. Can I just see that arm for a sec? Right? Like he investigated. He says he investigated carefully so he could systematically document it. In fact, even, you know, non-religious historians hold the book of Luke in high regard. They're like, it is very well written, recorded, and accurate. It documents history, places, people. It's accurate. It's amazing. Anyways, and he says the reason he's writing is not to be this amazing historical document. He's like, he has a friend named Theophilus. We'll call him Theo. His friend Theo, who doesn't believe in Jesus. He's not a Jesus person. He's like, I've written this whole story so that you can know who Jesus is. You can believe in Jesus. So uh, that's the, the story. And so if, you know, if we could summarize the book of Luke, like the forest of Jesus's life, so to speak, every week, we zero in on one tree. That's how I'd like to describe this series. And so today we're jumping in on another detail, right? If Jesus' life is the gospel, the good news of Jesus, everything Jesus ever did, the good news, we are zeroing in on every tree of that good news. We just think it's that important. It's that worthy of our time and attention. So Luke 8, verse 40, Luke chapter 8, verse 40. If you're new to Bible reading, Luke is about three quarters of the way through the book and eight is the chapter number. It's the big number and 40 is the small number and the little subscript kind of thing. And that just... Added after the fact so people can always say, I'm talking about this section and that section. Um, people didn't write letters and number their sentences back in the day. We added that just to help out. But in case you're new to Bible reading, I know a lot of you are, uh, that's how you find Luke chapter 8, verse 40, or just type in Luke 840 on Google. Okay? There, that'll help too. Um, so as we jump in, we kind of find ourselves last week and this week in like a four part mini series where there's four things that confront Jesus that are bad, and Jesus shows us that he has power over all of them. There's storms, demons, we covered those last week, and then today, sickness and death. We cover those. Basically, we learn in this little, you know, mini-series that Jesus, there's nothing that's outside of his power. Storms, supernatural elements are inside his power. The demonic, dark forces of evil inside of his, like, he can handle that. Sickness and death, none of those things hold Jesus back. And so, yeah, amen, thanks. Before we start, let me just remind you of the context, okay? So last week, Jesus went on a short little field trip to a place we nicknamed Uncleanville. Because remember, all of Jesus' disciples are these young Jewish guys. And like, they know what the J Jewish tradition is and the things they're allowed to interact with and not interact with. And Jesus takes them to a place with at least four things that are problematic. Gentiles, non-Jewish people. Pigs, remember they can't eat pork. Demons, and dead bodies. Remember, the guy was living among the tombs, okay? And so, anyways, that story ends. Jesus sets a person free. He actually tells the guy, he's like, hey, now you get to go and tell them everything that God's ever done for you. And he's like proclaiming it. He's so excited. He's like, tell everybody. And he does. So he goes off, tells everybody. And this week, in the bonus content, if you're like, what's the bonus content? We send out a newsletter every week. I don't know if you knew that, but we send out a newsletter every week, let you know what's happening behind the scenes here at Lakeside. If you don't get it, you can go on our website right now on the front page and scroll down three quarters of the way down, type in your email address, and we'll send you that every week. And in there, whoever preached that week, their bonus content is going to be there. And we sometimes four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten minutes of bonus content of things we didn't have time to talk about. It's basically like the tangent section, okay? The tangents I wish I could have taken. And in this week's bonus content, I tell all about, you know, simple ways that you can share your faith, share what God has done in your life with the people around you, okay? So you don't want to miss that, and uh, you can sign up on our website. All right, so with that said, they have this incredible encounter with this man who has the equivalent of 5,000 demons. Heal him, send him off, just go and tell people your experience. It's awesome. And they return home from this little field trip, and that's where we pick up. Everybody, you're with me? 
Okay, end of the field trip. Here it is. Now, when Jesus returned, verse 40, a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Don't, don't miss this. This is like the exact opposite. He left the place because they're like, get out of here. It's like Uncleanville doesn't want him. And now he's back on what appears to be like Jewish territory and they're welcoming him. They want him to be there. In fact, news traveled that he was coming back. Just think of how did news travel? He was coming back. News traveled. They're so excited. They were waiting for him. Then a man named Jairus, a synagogue leader came. And it's almost like if you're reading curiously, it's like, dun, 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 right? Like there's, if, if you're reading this and thinking through it, your heart should be racing in this moment because Jairus is a synagogue leader. What's a synagogue leader? It's someone who had general oversight over the synagogue, the Jewish religious institution. He was entrusted with orthodox teaching to make sure that everything that was being taught was right, building maintenance, acquiring scrolls for scripture reading, and organizing Sabbath worship, okay? Like this guy's through and through a religious professional. If anyone knows Jewish moral code, Jairus should. And that includes that you shouldn't hang around with Gentiles, dead bodies, demons, and pigs. And he approaches Jesus. Everyone's excited to see Jesus. And then he approaches and it's almost like the screen goes dark, right? It's like, what's coming? I'm feeling like I've seen this movie before. You expect a lecture, you expect questions, you expect him to declare that Jesus is unclean because of his interactions he just had, and then the unexpected happens. He falls at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. I love this about Jesus. Just as you're starting to get comfortable in your categories, just as you're starting to, every time a religious leader is mentioned in the gospel, you're thinking to yourself, oh, here they come again. And Jesus is gonna lay the smack down again. All of a sudden, before you can, you know, activate your prejudices, your prejudgments, here comes the conservative religious leader and we expect something from him and he breaks out of the category and our ability to prejudge him is taken away. It shows us when dealing with Jesus, we never hold out hope and we never prejudge and predetermine an outcome because with Jesus, it's always unexpected. I love that. Now, this man is distraught and for good reason. His daughter is dying. He has no time for religious games like some of his contemporaries. He's distraught. She's 12 years old. She's just hitting puberty. She's almost at betrothal age. She's about to get married. And now she's dying right before this significant moment in her life. And he's overwhelmed. And he comes and he bows down before Jesus. And he asks him for help. So Jesus goes with him. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. So he's like, yeah, I'm coming with you. And then the crowds just swarm Jesus. If this is a movie, I'm squeezing Trifina's hand at this moment. Like I get way into movies. I'm like, my heart palpitates. I'm like, I'm sweating. I'm nervous. I'm crying. I'm the emotional one in our relationship. And if this is a movie, I'm like, guys, like move out of the way. She's dying. Come on. Like, I'm like, I'm doing the act. I'm French Canadian. Like, I'm like, you know, like, ah, right. Like we just, we speak with our hands and I was like, come on move. This is important, right? Like I'm yelling at the television screen, like something's going to change, but it's, it's already been filmed. Don't miss this. The word that actually gets translated crushed him is actually the same word that's used when Jesus talks just a few verses earlier about the seed they got choked out. Do you remember that verse when he talks about the seed that lands in the different soil? He says the one seed they got choked out. It's the exact same word that it uses to describe this crowd. And it's the only time in the entire book of Luke where, Jesus, or where, Je where Luke uses this word to describe what's happening. He uses the same word that Jesus uses to describe when people's worries and pleasures and all their different things in their life get in the way. And he uses this to describe the crowd of people. I don't think it's accidental. Sometimes it appears as though God is moving. It appears as though he's doing something and people come along Religious people come along, well-meaning people come along, people who are desperate for their own needs come along and get in the way of what it appeared as though God was doing. Some of you have had that experience in your life. Some of you could actually name those people or that crowd of people, the group of people, the organization that those people were from. And there's something in you that feels anger 
towards that, don't miss the fact that that word is chosen carefully. And at the end, I'm gonna talk about that feeling if you've ever had it. So plot twist. And a woman, so now Jesus is trying to get to this young girl, 12 years old. The crowd just, you know, literally is like choking him out, so to speak. It's like it's getting in the way of something good growing out of this moment. And then there's a plot twist. A woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. Now, there's lots going on in this sentence. Let me unpack it for you. First of all, uh, she's ritually unclean. According to, you know, Jewish tradition, Jewish law, bleeding was considered unclean. Blood was considered unclean. That's why you couldn't eat a rare steak. How depressing, right? And so anything that had to do with blood was unclean. That meant women once a month were declared ceremonially unclean and had to stay away from other people, okay? That was the, the tradition of the day. This woman has had a condition where she has been bleeding nonstop for 12 years. That means she has been isolated. She's been, so to speak, in lockdown for 12 years. 12 is also an interesting number. It's also the age of the girl who's dying. So as long as that girl has been alive, this woman has been suffering. Don't, that, don't let that get lost on you. She came up behind him, behind Jesus, and touched the edge of his cloak. She barely gets him, she just touches the edge. And immediately, her bleeding stopped. Now, the edge of the cloak is actually a really fascinating idea. You literally will find entire sermons, entire you know, scholarly articles on the, the, the significance of the edge of the cloak of a rabbi, okay? It's fascinating. We're not going there today. You can deep dive that if that fascinates you, okay? I'm, I'm more kindergarten level, so this is the question I have. Does that count? Like, you know, in kindergarten when you're playing tag and someone hits you and you're like, you're it. It's like, no, no, that was my jacket. It's like, you're still it. Like, no, no, jacket, not me. I'm not it. The jacket's it, but I'm not it. You're still it, right? Like, you ever played that game? Am I the only one who remembers that? So I'm kind of like, I'm reading this at my kindergarten level where I pretty much operate most of the time. And I'm like, so is Jesus technically unclean now because an unclean person touched him or is it because it touched his clothes? He's like, no, no, it doesn't count. <laughs> Which is it? Because I'm like, well, what's gonna happen here, right? It's like, hello, Jesus actually just clarifies it really quickly. He, in the next verse, will actually say, who touched me? That he clarifies that he touched my clothes, he touched me. He's like, I'm just calling it out. Someone touched me. So we get the answer. Now, I don't want you to miss this. Because while the religious people might be thinking, did it count? Did it not count? Does it count? Is he unclean, clean? Does he need to now go through the rites of getting you know, purified so he can come back to, what happens now? I want you to think about this woman. I want you to think about her courage. Do you remember the first lockdowns in the midst of the COVID pandemic? Like the first ones, you know, where we were like all getting to like, oh, I think I feel something, I'm going to get tested. Remember that? It's like every other friend you talked to was like waiting six to eight days to get their test results back. Unless you had a red and white health card, then you were waiting like nine to 10 days because you couldn't check it online. Remember that? It's like all the government threatening emails couldn't get me to change it, but I gave up my red and white health card when I had to stay home for an extra two days. That's for sure. Do you remember how on the nightly news, there would always be this story like, and then this person who was supposed to be isolating and waiting for their results, they went grocery shopping recklessly. And when they got home, they got their results and they had COVID. Now there's 17 people and counting that have been traced back to that one person's active device. Do you remember that? Do you remember the outrage that we all felt at the gall of that person to go out and do that? We thought, how reckless. How could you not think of anybody else? How could you only think about yourself? Do you remember those different emotions and the outrage and the blogs and the tweets? And the, do you remember that? Feel that for a second because it's important in this moment. In a culture where Jewish cleanliness law was so important to people, a bleeding woman who all of them would have categorized as unclean shows up to the equivalent of a mosh pit, aware that everybody she touches will now be ceremonially unclean. She's so desperate. Not only does she push through the crowd, infecting everyone, so to speak, but she reaches out and has the audacity to touch a man that even the synagogue ruler bows in front of. Don't miss that. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, that means all of them denied it. That means she denied it. She lied about what she had just done. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. Jesus, it's like, Jesus, you're in a mosh pit. Of course you're getting touched, right? Like, come on. Then the woman 
seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. Trembling, why? Lots of reasons. She just made everyone unclean, including Jesus. Jesus may freak out on her. The crowd may freak out on her. You ever seen what crowds do when they get together and despise someone or are upset at someone? Things get real heated real quick. She's already been exiled for 12 years. Imagine now what's gonna happen to her. And the worst part, they never mentioned this in Sunday school, but I just think this is fascinating to me. Technically, she just stole a miracle. Like she didn't have permission to take it. She just got healed, but she didn't have permission. Jesus usually offers a healing or is asked for a healing. But this is the one and only time where someone steals a healing. It's like, she just got her hand caught in the cookie jar, right? It's like, who, took, who touched me? Jesus knew that power had gone out of him. She's like, uh-oh, I just got caught stealing a miracle from Jesus, son of God. I feel like this isn't gonna go well for me, right? Like, can we just acknowledge, like, there's a reason why in that moment she denied it. She has all these potential thoughts going through her mind as to what could happen to her next. And then this is the response. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Jesus does not turn to her and say, it's nice that you got healed, but I'm gonna have to take that one back. And you know, I'm, I'm sorry about this, but I really need to teach everyone a lesson that when I said no stealing, I meant no stealing, even miracles. Jesus doesn't say that. I love that he doesn't say that, right? In fact, look at what he says. Not, not church people, non-Christians, like pay attention to this. Curious about Jesus, trying to understand who Jesus is. Pay attention to this. This is why people like Jesus. Then he said to her, daughter, daughter. Is that your response? Parents, let me talk to you a second. When you found out that a child stole from you or lied to you, is that your response? daughter, son, it's not mine, just saying, right? Daughter, don't miss this. She has been isolated for 12 years. She has not been with people. She has not been with family. She probably has not received a hug for 12 years. Jesus' response is a term of endearment, a term of family, a term of community, a term of intimacy. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Now we'll come back to the faith part. That's important. We're gonna end there. And that faith piece, it's a synonym for trust and belief and faith. But I don't want you to miss this, that when Jesus calls it out, the reason I would suggest that she lied is because she was terrified of the shame for all the reasons that I mentioned that she would feel in that moment. What appears to be shame motivated, a calling out who touched me is motivated actually for restoration. That Jesus will declare in front of the entire crowd, you are clean, you are restored, you are welcomed back into community. That's so encouraging because sickness and poverty are usually the cycle that just continues to grow and build and build and get deeper and deeper. It's the spiral of sickness and poverty. And you see it all over the world, especially without social safety nets as they did not have in that time. Imagine how far down the spiral she has gone in 12 years. Jesus wants everyone to know she is healed, she is clean, and she is welcomed back in community. Her healing happened in anonymity but her restoration happened in community. Have you noticed how many miracles aren't just about an ailment, but they're about restoration into community? Here's how I'd summarize it. She is healed and she's restored into community. Now, we'll come back to that, but now there's a, another plot twist. Okay, so hang with me for a second because one person's gain, she's healed after 12 years, is another person's loss. Let's look at verse 49. While Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Update, your daughter's dead, he said. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Whew. I wanna imagine there was some big emotions in this moment. You just got the news that your daughter has not just passed away, 
but you realize it was preventable. If Jesus hadn't been interrupted by this crowd, this crowd that choked him out, if the crowds weren't here, my daughter might still be alive. If this woman hadn't stolen a miracle and Jesus didn't have to restore her publicly, my daughter would still be alive. Whatever emotions this father is feeling in this moment, nobody would blame him in the moment. Grief takes all kinds of shapes and sizes. Verse 50 though, hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe and she will be healed. When he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, and James and the child's father and mother. No crowd allowed in this house. Little comment here. Sometimes what isn't happening in a story is just as important as what is, but you do gotta look for it. You know what Jairus doesn't say when Jesus shows up at his house? Uh, hey, Jesus, I'm sorry, but I'm gonna have to stop you right there. You're not allowed to come into my house because technically an unclean woman touched you and so technically you're not clean either. Think about it. Jesus is literally a walking religious law violation in this moment, according to Jewish law. He's unclean. A bleeding woman touched him. The religious leaders would have been all over this. They freak out when disciples picked a couple heads of grain as a snack and they're like, aha, harvesting on the Sabbath, gotcha. What do you think they'd say now when he just got touched? What's different here? I'll tell you my thoughts. This man is personally invested. This religious leader is not picking on strangers for religious technicalities. His loved one is involved. The life of a loved one is on the line. Jairus, the synagogue leader, doesn't even mention the technicality and Jesus seems to agree. In this case, it does not seem to matter for what's at stake. Now, here's a throwaway tangent I wish we could spend more time on. Maybe I'll unpack it in the bonus content, but it's amazing how many times in history, in the midst of theological discernment and trying to you know, unpack what is Jesus asking us to do in this moment? You know, there are times as Christians where we wrestle, okay, so is this the thing Jesus would do? Or in this situation, is this the thing that Jesus would do? Or would we treat these people this way or that way? It is so amazing to me the number of times that we try and figure out the Jesus way and how often we have those conversations without the very people who are involved in the situation and the implications on their lives. And I think we've realized how important it is to actually invite people who are relationally invested in an issue to be part of the dialogue and not just ivory tower theologians. It's fascinating to me that this man is just so desperate for his daughter's healing. He lets Jesus in the house. Verse 52, meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She's not dead, but asleep. Okay, that strikes me as a little bit odd thing to say, but it'll make sense in a second. This is even stranger. They laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. Now, let's just put ourselves in that situation. Your friend's child just died. You're at the funeral grieving, and someone walks in and has the audacity to say, they're not dead, they're asleep, okay? Let's say someone did that, and you're in the midst of grieving. You're, it says they were mourning. Is your response laughter? Like, ha ha, no, it's, can you please leave? Can you get out? Do you not notice the solemn moment that this is? Like, what are you doing? You might have some choice words for them if they come in so flippantly in the middle of a funeral. But what you need to understand about this moment and why it's so significant for what's about to happen is that in this culture, they had something called professional mourners. We don't have those in North America, but there are some in different parts of the world. And in this culture, they had professional mourners. Think of it kind of like the equivalent of volunteer firefighters. It's like they have their own you know, full-time gig, but when there's a crisis, they get called. And so these people were literally like, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm a volunteer professional mourner. And so they would show up the moment somebody died and they would mourn. And if you've ever seen it, or you ever watched a video of it, it's quite an intense thing to see and to experience, okay? Now, why this is important is because they may not even be relationally connected to this person, but they're there and they're grieving and they're mourning. And here's the thing we know. They've seen a lot of dead bodies and they know one when they see one. So when Jesus is like, she's not dead, she's asleep, they're like, no, 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 she is dead. Trust us, we know. So we have a validated moment where it's like, no, this girl is actually dead. 
And then my favorite part of the story, hands down, is right here. But he took her by the hand and said, my child, get up. Now, I just have to giggle at this point because I'm like, Jesus, you're always in trouble with the religious police, always for all the religious violations that you seem to, you know, accumulate. And it's already been a day, Jesus. Like, seriously, a bleeding woman touched you. At least with that one, you had plausible deniability. You could be like, guys, yeah, I know she touched me, but like, come on, I was in a crowd. She touched me. I didn't reach out and touch her. Like, you know, there's some plausible deniability there. But now, Jesus reaches out and touches a corpse, a big no-no in Jewish cleanliness law. If I'm a disciple, I'd be like, seriously, Jesus? Seriously, can you give us one day without doing something controversial? Our complaints department is overwhelmed as it is. Come on. Jesus, we know you can heal from a distance. You came in the house, that was good enough. Did you really have to touch the dead body? Really? Really? Now, what's going on here? I don't, I don't know entirely. I can't read Jesus's mind. I just have the facts. You know, is this Jesus on a mission to blow up the idolization of a religious purity code, which often got in the way of love? Jesus has already done that in the past with the Sabbath when he realizes that people are, in, you know, fighting for the rules of Sabbath, but not fighting for life. Will he continue to oppose religious tradition that harms people? Or is this just simply the humanity of Jesus and the power of touch. There's a reason Jesus came in the human flesh to live the human experience and he understands human need. And if you've ever been at the bedside of someone who's on the last breath of life or fighting for their life, a hand to hold is such a powerful, physical, human thing. And when God steps into the world, he is not aloof to those realities. I don't know which it is. Is it none of those? Is it all of them? I don't know, but I'm just reading this story. I'm here for all of it. I just love that Jesus just does not care what other people think. He reaches out, he touches her hand. Verse 55, her spirit returned. And at once she stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. I love that, right? Why, again, why, why give her something to eat? A few reasons. One, probably hungry, right? Living people need to eat and she's alive. Maybe it's that simple. Maybe it's the fact that the meal is the crux of fellowship and community in that world, Jesus was not just restoring her life, but he was restoring her to family and community. Do you notice the theme? Jesus doesn't just heal people as we just saw with the bleeding woman. He restores them to community. With the woman who bled for 12 years, with the leper, the paralytic, the man with the withered hand, the man with 5,000 demons, now a young woman who has died and many others. And this is good news. This is great news. Because if you watch the news, you look at world history, there's never been a time where we have been without a need for community restoration. You look at every system, communism, capitalism, and every other ism there is, none have solved our community crisis and our need for restoration. We need help. And I love the way that N.T. Wright summarizes what's happening in this passage. He says, the presence of Jesus getting his hands dirty. I love that with the problems of the world is what we need and what in the gospel, in the story and life of Jesus, we are promised. I love that. The story's not over though, is it? There's one more verse. Her parents were astonished, but he ordered them, ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. Sorry, Jesus. Did you just tell these people not to tell them what you just did here today? Because I'm pretty sure your MO to the guy with the many demons was like, go and tell everybody. And now they can't tell anybody. It's like, well, what about the woman who you healed? Like you made a point. You made it public. Like everybody in the crowd knew, like you keep telling us to tell and now we're not allowed to tell? What's going on here? Which is it? Do you want us to talk about you? Do we not want to talk about you? Again, there's no certainty here. There's some really good hypotheses as to the reason why, and I wish I could tell you I knew for sure which one it was. I don't, but I can share with you my favorite one, the one that resonates the most with me, and you're welcome to research and read all the other hypotheses, but really, I just don't think we should give certainty because the text isn't clear. It just says, he says to the parents, don't tell anyone what he's just done. So here's the one that makes no, most sense to me. Again, I'm not promising certainty on this one. 
She's 12. She's 12. From the moment Jesus shows up, he respects her privacy. He limits the number of people who are allowed in the room. There's no crowds allowed here. He heals her, not for a public spectacle, not to help people's faith in that moment. He heals her to restore her life and to restore her to community. The moment that the parents start telling people what has happened, she becomes, this young 12-year-old girl, becomes a spectacle. Her life gets put under the microscope. She will be run through public opinion. Her life will be scrutinized. Were you really dead? Was it just a seizure? Were you just taking a long nap? Partying too hard the night before? Passed out? Right? She doesn't need that. She doesn't need that. The miracle restored her to life. Jesus doesn't need the publicity at the risk of this young woman. And it's not the parent's story to tell. Notice, notice who he tells not to tell? The parents. Basically, you don't get to run your child through the mud. Not your story to tell. Respect her autonomy. Notice he doesn't tell her that she can't tell anyone. She has the autonomy to tell her story and to choose how it gets told. Friends, to me, that's glaringly obvious. Maybe not to you, and that's okay. We don't have to agree. That's not law and gospel. That's just some commentary on why maybe that's happening in the moment. Here's the thing we agree on. She's healed and she's restored. Before we switch gears, here's the thing I wanna camp on for a minute, and then we'll just pause and let the Spirit speak to us. Both parties, the father whose daughter was dying and the woman who is bleeding, put their faith, their trust in Jesus. Jairus risked his reputation and his job because he was so sure that Jesus would bring life change. He put all of his faith and his trust in Jesus. And she, the bleeding woman, risked it all. She put her faith and trust in Jesus. She knows how bad this could go when she walks through a crowd of people as someone who is determined to be unclean. She puts all her faith in Jesus, all her eggs in one basket. Two people you would not expect to show up at the feet of Jesus, an unclean woman and a religious leader. Here's the question I need to ask. What led them to put their trust, to put their faith in Jesus? And the reason why I think it's such an important question to ask is because at Lakeside, we wanna help people discover and fully follow Jesus. We want people to put all of their faith, all of their trust, want them to reorient their entire lives to choose to follow Jesus, to put their trust in him. And here we have a 2,000 year old example of two people who chose to put their trust in him. And I'm like, why would they do that? I wanna learn from that because we wanna help other people do the same thing. Here's what I don't think. I don't think they woke up that morning and as they're wandering around, they saw a billboard and thought, oh, an event, a new guy in town, Jesus, never heard of him. I think I'll show up. Hey, are you Jesus? You look like the billboard. I don't think that's what happened. I don't think they read a bumper sticker that said Jesus saves. I don't think they did that. And then decide, ah, the bumper sticker says it, that settles it. I'm going to put all my trust in him. I'm risking my reputation. I'm risking my job. I'm risking another 12 years of isolation. I don't think that's what happened. I think the facts are that we're already in chapter eight of Luke, that Jesus has been around for months, if not years, in the region, that there's nobody that has not heard of him, that literally he's on a boat ride, there's no social media, and somehow word gets to these townspeople and they're at the edge of the water waiting for him to return. Everyone knew who Jesus was. Everyone knew what he was doing, what he was saying, what he was like. Word was spreading. This woman who had been bleeding for 12 years did not just show up when there was a crowd and touch people and hope for healing. After 12 years, she steps out of isolation because she, even in her isolation, had gotten word of who Jesus was and what Jesus was like. The evidence of his character and his person led her to faith, in my opinion. Here's how I would summarize it for both these people. The person and work of Jesus led them to a place where they were willing to trust in Jesus. This is important. 
And this is often lost on us. We tell people they need Jesus and we don't tell them what Jesus is like. That's important. Think about this for a second. The entire book of Luke, every detail, every tree, so to speak, that Luke camps out on and gives the details of Jesus's life and Jesus's teachings and Jesus's interactions, every single example was put in the book to help his friend Theo find faith in Jesus. That the work of Jesus and the teaching of Jesus and the words of Jesus were all mission critical to helping someone actually trust Jesus. As I'm going through Luke and I'm pausing at every one of these trees, it's helping me realize that often we leave Jesus's life out of it. We need more of the life of Jesus, not less. We need more gospel, more good news, more of the entire life of Jesus. Because I'm utterly convinced that these people, it was hearing the life that he lived, his teachings, his miracles, his posture that led them to take a risk and to put all their faith in Jesus. Everything about Jesus's life, not just the cross, and I'm not belittling the cross. We have nothing without the cross. But the entire life of Jesus was mission critical to helping someone get to the point where they would trust their life with Jesus. So friends, here's where I wanna end. I just wanna ask this question. What does God wanna say to you? What parts of the story needed to be resonating in your soul today? That Jesus is God. Jesus is a perfect representation of what God is like. And so today we have stared at the glory of God in the person of Jesus. What of that glory are you meant to just sit in awe of for a moment? What part of this story does Jesus just want you to know that this is exactly what God is like. Let me give you a few options and maybe it's something completely different. Is it the way that he chose to ignore the ritual rules for the sake of love? Maybe that's healing for you today. Maybe you grew up in a house of legalism, but often love was sacrificed to keep the legalism going. Maybe the idea of Jesus not freaking out about ritual impurity imposed on him or touching a corpse, somehow that was good news for you today. And you just breathe a sigh of relief. This is what Jesus is like. This is what God is like. This is the glory of God. And you just needed to stare at that glory today. Maybe it's the fact that Jesus meets us in our desperation. That when we desperately reach out, when we are just so in need of help and healing, and even we don't do it necessarily the right way, we don't approach it or we don't know how to approach it or we're nervous to approach it. So like, I'm not sure, do I bow or do I kneel or do I say, you know, Jesus, and do I call him Lord or our heaven? Like, what do, how do I, how do I, I don't even know how to approach him. And it's just like, you can just reach out. You can touch him. That he sees our pain and he moves towards us with healing, even if we don't approach him in the right way. Maybe today, you're in a choked out by the crowd kind of moment. Like this dad who had a glimpse of hope as Jesus started to move towards his house and then it was taken away in an instant. You feel like maybe God was moving in your life and something good was coming and it feels like something or someone or some people or a group of people choked it out like messed it up, like really messed it up. Like you're mad. Like you're gonna have a conniption. You're just like, God, I, I swear you were working in this moment. I don't understand what's going on here. You just needed to see this story and then know that Jesus is still with you, that he's still for you, that he is still about healing and restoration and what feels lost in this moment will always be redeemed, whether in this life or the next. That you need to be reminded that death never gets the final word with Jesus. Maybe you're sick and unwell. You've tried everything, you've gone to everyone, but you've never come to Jesus. Our prayer teams are gonna be up at the crosses in a couple moments and you're welcome to go and pray and be prayed for actually. 
And maybe, maybe you've seen enough now. Maybe like the woman and maybe like Jairus, you're like, I like Jesus. I trust Jesus. And I wanna commit my life to him and learn what it means to live a life as a Jesus follower. And maybe today your next step is to reach out online. You can reach out to our online pastor. You can reach out to any of us on our website. You can find our contact info. As a ministry team, as pastors, we would love to chat with you and tell you what it means and looks like to choose a relationship with Jesus, to choose to follow Jesus, to choose to put your entire trust, to reorient your entire life to follow Jesus. We would love that conversation. Can I just invite you to be still for a moment? Just be still for a minute. And just ask the Holy Spirit, what is, what is he bring to mind? What does he wanna say to you? What of the glory of God in this story needs to be brought home today? Just be still. friends. Thanks for joining us today, whether online or in the room. We're just so honored to have had this time with you today. Trust that God spoke to you. And again, our prayer ministers are going to be up at the front. You can go for prayer for anything and everything. Newcomer meet and greet is just outside those doors. You're going to see some of our staff. I'll be there. We'd love to greet you, elbow bump you, and just get to know you. So if you've never been to a newcomer meet and greet, even if you've been with us for you know a few months now, we just love to meet you and connect. There's no official program. It's just connect and head out whenever you want, but we would just so love the opportunity to meet you. And as you go, can I just encourage you? Today, you've gotten a glimpse of exactly what God is like. Go in peace, friends.